Peace Summit to be held on the 7th and 8th of July 2017. And I call first of all, on behalf of Council, Mr. Mati Masikas. Thank you, President. And first of all, uh, please let me say a few words. I am very proud to stand here uh, representing Estonia in the European Parliament, to be representing uh, Estonia and Estonia's presidency. I hope to have great cooperation and I would like to thank you for how, how well I have been received in this uh, House. Thank you. I'm grateful for your invitation to discuss the G20 summit which Germany hosts from Friday in Hamburg. At the summit, G20 leaders, including Presidents Tusk and Juncker, will be faced with intense discussions on various topics of global importance. The international political environment is currently particularly charged, and global cooperation can no longer be taken for granted. In this context, the mission of European leaders is clear. The G20 is central to this effort, since it is, as G20 leaders stated in Pittsburgh in 2009, the premier forum for international economic cooperation. It is also central to give a clear signal that securing balanced and inclusive growth remains a top priority. Even if the global economy is showing a positive momentum, political uncertainty surrounding the outlook is still high. Allow me to expand on a selection of issues which I think will take a center stage in Hamburg. I will refer to trade, climate, migration, digitalization and countering terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, it should be the EU's priority to send a strong signal to the G20 of our commitment to open trade and multilateralism. As recalled by the June European Council, the EU will pursue a robust trade policy, upholding an open and rules-based multilateral trading system with a central role for the WTO. The EU will also keep markets open and fight protectionism, firm in the belief that trade contributes to creating wealth and jobs. The EU will therefore actively pr promote an ambitious free trade agenda on the global stage. In this respect, reaching a political agreement on the EU-Japan trade deal ahead of the G20 meeting would send a strong signal against protectionism. We need to improve the daily lives of citizens by ensuring that the benefits of globalization are more widely shared. As was stressed by the June European Council, we need to foster a truly level playing field while remaining vigilant concerning the respect and promotion of key standards, including social, environmental, health and consumer standards that are central to the European way of life. And beyond that, we must also be able to better communicate the actual benefits of trade to the wider public. On climate change, we are all aware that the global community needs to act urgently and move forward with the implementation of the Paris Agreement. The unilateral decision by the United States administration to withdraw from the Paris Agreement is therefore a highly regrettable step. We have already discussed this issue here in the European Parliament during the June session. As you are aware, the EU's commitment to implementing the Paris Agreement fully was strongly reaffirmed by the June European Council. The agreement remains a cornerstone of global efforts to effectively tackle climate change and it cannot be renegotiated. Re I can only further confirm that the Council, under the Estonian Presidency, will continue in its commitment to ambitious global action against climate change and support the global ownership of the Paris Agreement. The EU and its member states are playing their full part in implementing the agreement, both through the development of our domestic policies and in keeping with our commitment to global solidarity. We will have to minimize the effects of the US decision on the effectiveness and credibility of the climate framework. The presidency believes that we should continue our dialogue and engagement with the US. At the same time, we can also be encouraged by strong statements of commitment as well as pledges by local governments, businesses, cities, communities and other non-state actors in America. These developments underscore the importance of the action agenda 
as a platform to connect the different non-state actors. Its importance is expected to grow in the coming years, boosting the political profile and momentum for climate action. My third point is on migration. Dealing with the migration crisis has been at the, at the core of the political debate in the EU, including here in the European Parliament, and it's all the more pertinent today in the light of the, of the news from the Central Mediterranean and Italy. Naturally, we tend to focus on our migration crisis in our part of the world, but migration is, is not a European phenomenon, nor is managing it solely a European responsibility. It is rather a global responsibility, requir requiring collective solutions in full respect for our obligations under international law. In this regard, the G20 is launching the G20 Africa Partnership. It should foster sustainable and inclusive Europe, uh, eco economic growth and development. It will contribute to creating decent employment, particularly for women and youth, thus addressing poverty and the root causes of migration. This also ties in closely with the ongoing legislative work in the EU on the external investment plan, including the European Fund for Sustainable Development and the European Investment Bank's external lending mandate. We are also committed to taking an active part in the follow-up to the UN summit on addressing large movements of refugees and migration held in September last year. The EU intends to play a prominent role in the process leading to the establishment in 2018 of UN Global Compacts on Migration and Refugees, and we would ask all G20 members to engage as well. Digitalization is a key priority for the Estonian presidency, and therefore we welcome the inclusion of this topic at the G20 summit. Information and communications technology are no longer a specific sector, they are the backbone of all modern innovative economic systems. Therefore, we need to bridge digital gaps based on inter alia, age, geography, gender and income. However, technological pro uh, pro uh, progress also involves challenges to our security and democracy, which we expect to be reflected by the G20. These challenges highlight the need to strengthen consumer protection, transparency and security. In, in the use of information and communication technology. Ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, the EU has been on a global forefront on the fight against terrorism financing. Recently, <clears throat> an agreement on the revision of the fourth anti-money laundering, laundering agreement was reached. Countering terrorism requires holistic action, including improved cooperation and preventing violent extremism conducive to terrorism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. And we now hear from the Commission. Commissioner Timmermans, please, Vice President. Thank you very much, President. In the coming days, the G20 leaders will, gather in, will meet in, in Hamburg. It's an important moment. There are many new faces around the table, and there are many uh, challenges to address. The agenda is more far-reaching than previous meetings, showing that this format has potential to look far beyond its initial economic focus. The economy and trade will certainly feature large, but also the fight against terrorism, sustainable development, climate change and energy, migration, Africa, health, digitalization, employment, and women's empowerment. For the EU, the summit is an opportunity to highlight the positive contribution we are currently making to global growth. Our vision for a fair globalization set out in the reflection paper on harnessing globalization and our consistent leadership across multiple areas of the global agenda. Examples include our commitment to the Paris Agreement, progress on our progressive value, uh, values-based trade agenda and our engagement with the developing countries through the European Fund for Sustainable Development, which this House will vote still this week. In these times of turmoil, it is also the moment to show our unwavering commitment to global multilateral governance and a responsible international political dialogue aimed at delivering in the interest of people all over the world. Against the background of rising ultranationalist politics posing a risk to global economic growth and the rules-based global order, 
the G20 Hamburg Summit has the motto, Shaping an Interconnected World, to underline the necessity of multilateral cooperation for prosperity, security and freedom. Let me briefly run you through the main messages that we as EU want to give on the economy. We will highlight the positive contribution the EU is making to the global economy. The EU is growing at nearly 2% this year and next year. The European Investment Plan is well on track, having led to over 200 billion in additional and sustainable investments. We're getting our mojo back. On climate and energy, we will reaffirm our strong commitment to the Paris Agreement, clean energy transition and support for the poor and vulnerable in the fight against climate change. And we will maintain cohesion within the G19, despite the US decision to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. We would, of course, welcome it if the US would reconsider its decision. But let me be very clear. The deal cannot be renegotiated. On trade, we will present our vision for harnessing globalization instead of turning inward and resorting to protectionism. Because we all agree that, that there is no protect in protectionism, but there is isolation in isolationism. We will demonstrate that the EU will stand up for free and fair trade and for the multilateral trading system as a whole. And we will showcase the progress we're making in our progressive trade agenda with CETA with Canada and now the EU-Japan trade deal. And because trade should be fair, we are looking for a strong signal from China as to its full cooperation within the global forum on steel access capacity. On taxation, we will maintain momentum for the fight against tax evasion and avoidance, including next steps like defensive measures against non-cooperative tax jurisdictions and increased efforts to promote the availability and international exchange of information on beneficial ownership of legal persons and legal arrangements. On migration, this is a challenge that is going to be with us for quite some time to come, decades. We must preserve a commitment to a comprehensive global response to tackling irregular migration and forced displacement, including support for the UN Global Compact on Refugees and on regular safe orderly migration. And we must build support for a strengthened approach to break the business model of migrant smuggling. This is what we must do on a global stage. But let me add one thing. It would already make a world of difference in Europe if every single member state would live up to their commitments to show solidarity with those of our member states who are most affected by this challenge. We cannot leave Italy alone with this. Everybody should do their part. And we've shown in the past that if we stick together and find solutions that everybody shares, we can reach results. Surely the situation in Greece is not where we want it to be yet. There is still a lot to do. But if you look back at 2015 and look at the situation now, much has also improved. There is an incredible level of solidarity with refugees and migrants in Greece and in Italy. But the rest of Europe cannot just count on the solidarity of the people in Greece and Italy because the people there also have their limits. And we need to show that the rest of Europe understands this and does their part in helping solve this crisis. <laughs> on terrorism. On terrorism, we, we need an agreement on an action plan to advance the fight against terrorism. We will not win the battle against terrorist financing and the spread of radicalization online if we do not work with our international partners on this. On Africa, we will support close partnership with Africa to support sustainable growth and job migration. Yet just job creation. Just imagine we don't do this. Then our refugee problem in the future will be so much worse than it already is today. The only sustainable solution is growth and more optimism in Africa 
so that people understand that it is in their interest to stay in Africa and to develop their own countries instead of going to Europe. <laughs> Finally, I welcome the fact that the German presidency has put strong emphasis on stakeholder involvement. All engagement groups, business, labor, civil, science, the think tanks, women, youth, they all have been active and put forward recommendations. We are in a post-paternalistic society. We can no longer prescribe from politics or governance what should be done. We need to include the global brain power to make sure that we find the right solutions. That is how globalization will be shaped in the interest of humanity as a whole. Because at the end of the day, everything we do here in the European Parliament, at the Commission, is at the service of citizens, their freedoms and their ability to pursue their hopes and dreams. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Vice President, thank you very much. Then come back to the... That brings us on to the speakers. On behalf of the political groups, we'll start with the European People's Party, Mrs. Niebler for a minute and a half. Thank you very much, President. Uh, Presidency in office, uh, Vice President of the Commission, ladies and gentlemen, the last weeks have been overshadowed by sad news. I'm thinking of the death of the former Bundeskanzler Helmut Kohl, and I'm thinking about the first President of the European Parliament, Simone Weil, whom we pay tribute to yesterday as well, and a coach accident in my home region state of uh, Bavaria, which resulted in 18 fatalities and a number of injuries. And if you look at what's shaping up in Hamburg, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are uh, envisaging uh, demonstrations and further negative headlines uh, with this summit that happening at the weekend, which will dominate the headlines. If you look at the G20 and the selection of topics, it seems to me that uh, uh, we can count on there being dissent, especially on climate policy. Two messages from me nonetheless. Firstly, I believe it's important that industry and uh, Sunrise Nations come together and discuss uh, matters. I think that's what we learned from this uh, ceremony of honor that happened at the weekend here. It was unique. Uh, the message we were reminded of uh, from Helmut Kohl is that we keep the conversation open and seek solutions. So I think it's good that the G20 summit is happening. And if just a couple of uh, positive messages uh, emerge from it, such as on trade policy, then uh, and support for Africa, if that makes progress, then there will be substantial uh, advances made. And now on behalf of the Socialists and Democrats for two and a half minutes, Mr. Kofut. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, Council and also Commission. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, pay tribute to the Commission and Mr. Vice President Timmermans on the, on the issue of harnessing globalization and very important reflection paper that the Commission did this year, how to uh, ensure a fair globalization because globalization brings a lot of benefits to us but also a lot of challenges to our societies and the G20 summit in Hamburg is an opportunity for the EU to lead on how to create a more fair globalization where all is benefiting with very many important topics which has been mentioned already by by the speakers here on climate change on sustainable development goals on migration crisis and so on and I think it's important that we and European Union take the lead on all of these issues. Um, but I also want to say that on globalization, issues um, has troubled a lot of countries and citizens alike. And let me be clear and honest. When it comes to globalization, the free and unregulated market has to some extent failed us. It has worked extremely well for multinational corporations and already very wealthy individuals. But far too many ordinary workers, like the steel workers in France, or, and the UK, uh, or the slaughterhouses workers in Denmark and Germany, to take example. Globalization has also brought uh, unfair competition, negative wage pressure, job insecurity, and in many cases also unemployment. So, at the same time, enormous wealth has been created, but it has not yet been fairly shared. It's clear. Whilst the uh, world's eight richest people are now wealthier, they're now wealthier than half of the world's population. Real wages for middle-income families 
have stagnated in many of our societies, also throughout Europe. And in many EU countries, real wages have even shrunk. And this is an outrage, and I think we need to do something about this. This is a result of market liberalism run amok, and we need to change the course. So showing European leadership on harnessing globalization means ensuring that European values, principles, and standards shape globalization, not vice versa. And for the socialists and democrats, a key principle is global tax justice. It was also mentioned by the Commission, and I'm very happy for that. We call for global tax justice to be a top priority also at the G20 summit. And we want the EU to take the lead on concrete new initiatives. We need a global asset register so taxable assets can be tra traced and recovered. We need a global register of beneficial ownership so tax fraud can be revealed. We need also to coordinate efforts to stop, punish and prevent tax havens. Uh, and uh, this is also mentioned by the Commission. I think it's important we, we take the lead in that fight. We need also, um, you know, from ensuring that, that we need fair uh, corporate income tax as well. So this is an opportunity for EU. Let's take the lead on all of these issues and we look forward to the G20 summit and thank you for the great speech. And now for a minute and a half, Mrs. Stevens. Good morning, President, Commissioners, colleagues. These are turbulent times. We face challenges which, which spread far beyond the borders of the European Union. We face global challenges which connect us all and require global response. We face a humanitarian crisis, conflict at our doorstep, and a barely recovering economy. This is why we need the summit to be fruitful. Talk is cheap, and our electorate wants to see results. Unfortunately, leader summits have become better known for updating the family photo than for plotting a strategic course for the next 12 months. Leaders need to start looking at what they can realistically achieve at a global level in the next few months. And whilst the EU is willing to take on more and more responsibility at the world stage, the EU cannot start believing that it can solve every crisis by itself. We need an EU which doesn't think that just one policy can solve the migration crisis, but an EU which works with the UN, NATO, and the G20 to end the funding of terrorism and to punish the barbaric practice of human trafficking. The EU needs to sit at the table and commit to making the EU as global-facing and pro-free trade as possible. The EU needs to champion less regulation and lower taxes, not more red tape and bureaucracy. We need an EU which lives up to its obligations to protect the environment without stifling business, because it is jobs and growth which draw people out of poverty and prevents unsustainable economy migration. It is jobs and growth which bring countries closer together. Thank you. And gives people self-confidence and respect. That is what we need to better connect us as nations and to help us move forward with confidence, unity, and renewed vigor in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Liberal Group now for two minutes, Sophie Infeld. Yes, thank you, Chairman, and um, thank you to the, uh, the Presidency. Very welcome uh, in this House. Uh, thank you, Mr. Timmermans, for your, um, your intervention. I was very glad to hear you use the word challenge when you were speaking of migration and not crisis, because we're talking about the migration crisis a lot, whereas what is really going on here is that there is a political and a moral crisis. The, uh, I think the Estonian presidency is absolutely right in saying that migration management is a global responsibility and therefore uh, it is to be welcomed that the, the German presidency wants to put this firmly on the agenda of the G20 and making it uh, a global issue. Uh, at the same time, it is also European responsibility and as the Commissioner uh, set out very clearly, member states are not living up to their responsibility. They are abandoning Italy, they are abandoning Greece. 
I have to think back of the statement of uh, the Dutch Prime Minister once at the previous uh, mass influx of um, uh, migrants into Italy where a journalist asked the Prime Minister, well, isn't it uh, sad for Italy because of its geographical location that they have to uh, take in all the refugees? And the Prime Minister said, well, tough luck for Italy. That's been the attitude of Europe. And it is a shame. It is a shame. We are the most prosperous continent in the world. If we cannot manage this migration influx, then who can? So we have to start taking our responsibility. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that the European Commission has taken action, put forward a kind of uh, action plan uh, for Italy. Um, but first of all, uh, the focus is now very much on what NGOs are doing. But I think we should stop the blame game. You can never blame NGOs for saving people's lives. Secondly, I wonder why... I wonder why we are not using the legal instruments at our, uh, at our disposal, like the temporary protection me mechanism. We have it. Why is it not being used? It can be adopted in the Council by QMV. Thirdly, when will we stop using European money to fund the pockets of dictators and failed uh, regimes? How much more money are we going to send to Libya to let people die in miserable circumstances, not only in the Mediterranean, but also in the desert. It is about time. The European Commission So, Sophie, Sophie. Thank you very much. Now for three minutes, Fabio De Masi on behalf of the GUE Group. Herr Präsident, die President, the G20 is an event with no legitimacy, only the UN enjoys legitimacy. That's a quotation not from me, but the great French diplomat, resistance fighter and author of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, Stefan Hessel. So Hamburg will be indignant. My hometown, Germany's uh, most beautiful city, will host the G20 summit. Nonetheless, uh, many will forsake the city when the fine gentlemen Trump and Erdogan visit us. Hamburg, gateway to the world, will be like an exclusion zone so that demonstrators do not trouble the heads of state. We don't like shutdowns in Hamburg, as the world-famous Reeperbahn proves nightly. Of course, heads of state should talk to each other, particularly in crisis periods. They don't even have to do it in the Rocky Mountains. But the G20 is negotiating the fate of the world. These debates therefore belong in the UN, in New York, meaning that Mr. Trump wouldn't even be too far from his golf course. The G20 represents 80% of world GNP and they're meeting to discuss important topics. Trade, migration, tax dumping, climate change, security and terrorism. Tax refugees are the most expensive refugees. Up to 30 billion euros are stashed away in tax havens. About eight people, according to Oxfam, own as many assets as half the world's population. That is a morbid development. To that end, and not just since the financial crisis, we've needed uh, public investment in housing, schools and universities. However, the negotiations in the EU on a blacklist of tax havens have now fallen to diplomatic horse trading. We finally need to levy punitive taxes on financial flows into tax havens, both inside the EU and outside it. The wars in the Middle East, from Afghanistan via Iraq, Libya or Syria, have created chaos, state collapse, terror and flight. It's not just bombs that have laid waste uh, uh, to Africa, uh, but also free trade agreements such as the one the, UN, uh, the EU I'm sorry, is striving for with Japan after TTIP and CETA arms exports and cronyism with the godfathers of uh, terror such as Saudi Arabia or Erdogan, the EU's bouncer, have inflated the Islamic State. But the G20 are now discussing military repulsion of refugees and further lazy deals uh, with uh, Turkey and Egypt. The Saudi king wanted to bring his camels to Hamburg, no problem with that, but the port of Hamburg for its part is dispatching weapons to the dictatorships of the Gulf and the EU is seeking further to rearm through the Defence Union. Up to 2% of GNP is sought by NATO. That is the money we need in the fight against poverty and climate change. 
Therefore, a large majority of the people of Hamburg will peacefully take to the streets to protest against that policy. And that's the right thing to do. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Herr de Masi. Thank you, Mr. de Masi. The next speaker on behalf of the Green Groups for two minutes, Yannick Jadot. Mr. President. President, colleagues, we have paid tribute to Simone Weil this week. What can we learn from her journey, from her experience in terms of this morning's debate? Simone Weil fought for Europe because she survived the worst thing that Europe could produce. But she never said that Europe was just a commemoration, never reduced it to that. She always thought Europe was a project for civilization, for all men, for all women, for us as Europeans and for the rest of the world. Today, would Simone Weil be satisfied with this European project, uh, one of free movement of goods, services, investments, no obstacles to that, our legislation, our environmental regulations, our democratic sovereignty uh, would actually be in the hands of the big multinationals, oil, uh, endocrine disruptors, and so on and so forth, and also these walls, these fences, these camps, encircling people, people who are also still surviving today. Today, Europe is alone vis-a-vis -vis Putin, Erdogan, Trump, Jinping. Europe is alone, but Europe is also the only one that can actually support a cooperation project that will hold for the world, a project based on solidarity, thinking about the common good, projecting that. But for that to happen, Europe needs to change tack. When it comes to the G20, Europe should not be there to promote free trade agreements. These are the agreements that create so much chaos around the world. And this development model, which is so bad for the planet, uh, for pollution, if there's one element that Europe should bring to the table at the G20, it is the climate agreement, the climate decision. That's what we need to defend. And it's not just a question of respecting or abiding by the Paris Agreement. Europe is itself not on track when it comes to greenhouse gases and the other objectives of Paris. So let's be far more ambitious. Let's go to the G20 and say that G20 will put an end to public subsidies for fossil fuels and that this decision should be implemented straight away. That is your responsibility and it is also our responsibility if we want to really pay tribute to Simone Weil. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Thank you. On behalf of the FDD group, Raymond Finch for one minute. Thank you, President. The G20 meeting gives the EU an opportunity to speak to the major economies of the world and to find out what their perception of the post-Brexit landscape will be. I strongly suspect that the EU, and particularly the host nation Germany, are in for an unpleasant surprise. The non-EU countries will be eyeing up how to grab a bigger slice of the lucrative market of exports to the UK from you if the EU pursues its act of economic self-harm by trying to exclude the UK from fair access to the single market. The European Union's decision in declaring a post-Brexit economic war on the UK won't act as a deterrent to other would-be levers. Your huge trade surplus with the UK will crumble and other non-EU G20 nations will be licking their lips at the prospect of trading with and exporting to the UK. The revitalised, liberalised United Kingdom will be seen as a key trading partner by these nations, and we will see cars made in Detroit rather than Stuttgart on British roads. For your own economic well-being, I urge the EU negotiators to look into the hungry eyes of your fellow G20 nations and reflect upon the damage your present course will have on your pre precious project. Thank you. <clears throat> now for the ENF group, please, Marcel de Graaf, one minute. Voorzitter. President. What will the EU be doing at the G20? Why are they there, more to the point? The Council and the Commission don't have the know-how they need to attack the problems facing the European Union. 
unemployment has slipped around at dramatic levels and the debt mountain is higher than ever and we're still faced streams of thousands of migrants into the EU every day. Meanwhile, every week, terrorist attacks take place around our continent. Solutions in today's era come from patriots. The Commission should be modelling itself on the Visegrad countries rather than condemning them. Mr Juncker should learn a lesson from his party uh, colleague, Mr Orban. We should We've heard that it's NGOs being uh, shut down and their goods should be confiscated. Juncker should give Frontex the mandate to start using the Australian model. Boats should be towed back to Libya. Migrants are actually safer in Libya than British people in Britain, French people in France or Germans in Germany. You are an incompetent leader. I say that talking to Mr. Junkers and his sidekick, Mr. Tim. I say to both of you, stand down, resign. We've got the solutions. We can take on the responsibility, and we will be able to take the right and effective measures. Um, Mr. De Graaf, you have a blue card from our colleague, Hilde Wortmanns. Are you prepared to answer that? Yes, please. Thank you, President. Mr. De Graaf, it's not the first time I've heard you he's speak in this chamber where you're lashing out and making accusations against people who work very, very hard. What you've just said, suggesting that NGOs are criminal, these people are saving drowning people from the sea. I think that what we've just heard must be deleted from this debate. We're talking about human traffickers. Those are the people who should be punished. Why on earth should NGOs, which are doing a fantastic job out in the field, how can we treat them as criminals? President, I would like to suggest to you that those disgusting comments from Mr. de Graaf should be deleted from the proceedings. Europe should be doing its best to help these migrants. We shouldn't be blaming NGOs. We should be thanking them. I am very sorry with all the understanding one may have for your point. The blue card is there to ask a question of the speaker. You did not ask a question of the speaker. Please use the procedures that are foreseen. If you want to ask something to be deleted from the protocol, you can do so in a personal remark after the end of the debate. Um, so, Mr. De Graaf, you didn't have a question. We move on in our speakers list. Um, Christina Morvai speaks now as a non inscrit uh, good morning, colleagues, and uh, good morning, Vice President uh, Timmermans. Here we are again, and I have a question to you again, very specific question, and I would like you to give me a very specific answer, and also to Hungarians and some other people who are interested. Suppose we would follow your order and receive uh, migrants and refugees in my country, uh, uh, Hungary. You, as well as every single person in this room, know perfectly well that those people would not want to stay in Hungary because they want a better life. They would like to move on to richer countries like Germany, Austria, Sweden, and so on. Uh, Mr. Timmermans, how can we hold them back? What is the, the order, so to say, in this respect? Because we all know very well that we cannot put these people into like closed institution. They have the right to freedom of movement. I know we should integrate them. Uh, this will be probably the answer. But this is the wrong answer, Mr. Timmermans and dear colleagues, because they would not like to be integrated in Hungary. They would like to move on the next day to richer countries. So you must have a strategy on that because your whole strategy about the treatment of the migrant crisis is based on the idea of solidarity among member states and forcing all member states, including my country Hungary, to receive migrants. So how would you solve this problem? I look forward to your answer, Mr. Timmermans. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on now to other speakers, the first of which will be Mr. Yanis Lewandowski for one and a half minutes. 
Dziękuję. Thank you. Today, um, on the road to G20, uh, the President of the US is landing in Poland, uh, waiting for the promised very warm welcome, even though slightly artificial. If today he uses the guarantees of Article 5 of the NATO regulation, it will bring a lot of value for all those who are neighboring states to Putin's Russia, especially if they remember the old times and the Red Army. No, none of the countries should try to destabilize or weaken the EU. All of these countries should get together and uh, be part of the European defense policy. For many reasons, G20 is very difficult. It's a difficult task not only because of the uh, demonstrations and uh, everything that is happening in the, in the streets and uh, media. It's important because we talk about the North Atlantic uh, community of values, which uh, was very important after the war. That's why uh, the agenda is quite broad, but uh, maybe the expectations uh, will not become real. Uh, we have to set the minimum. What really puts us together? I think a fight with terrorism, trying to stop the migration flows, because this is where our security is at stake. I'm talking about the European and non-European security, but I hope we will manage to fight it. Thank you. Bernd Langer for two minutes. Thank you, President. President in office, Commissioner Timmermans. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a lot of bad news around the world recently. Angelica Niebler mentioned a few examples. This is why it's so important that we make the use of every opportunity we can to reinstate global governance. In the face of behavior from a series of countries which seem to be saying my country first or should I say my America first we should respond to them people first we need global governance in the interests of people around the world and to do that we need global structures I think that as part of that call the EU should lay emphasis on certain issues Africa for example we need to move towards a sustainable development program for Africa so as to ensure that people have every reason to stay at home uh, enjoying higher quality of life. In my view investment into Africa has to be an overriding priority for the European Union. The empowerment of women is also an essential issue. The ILO talks about the forgotten billion, that third billion, and we have to empower that third billion of women. We also need fair trade rather than just free trade. We have to move away from protectionism. The ILO talks about the hundreds of millions of people who are producing uh, low-cost goods as part of global production chains but they aren't able to lead a decent life with the money they earn that's not acceptable we have to ensure that we have fair labor chains we have to strengthen workers rights with a view to guaranteeing not just free trade but f fair trade so the G20 summit will take place in the beautiful city of Hamburg it's marked not only by its beautiful skyline but also by the powerful will of the people and Hamburg will be a symbol for we stand for thank you for one minute Anna Fotiga Thank you. In time of challenge, security should define credibility of partners, also trade partners. I therefore welcome the agreement with Japan. Uh, the dreams uh, before G20 were already overshadowed by exclusive deal between Russia and China and also rather unfriendly military exercises on Baltic Sea. Our response to this, the Western response to this, should be closer transatlantic alliance with both US and Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fortiga. For one and a half minutes now, Mr. Swain V. Giegold. Thank you, President. First of all, let me say clearly, I think it's a good thing that the G20 summit is taking place. The G20 summit 
is one of the few forums in which in an age of globalization and crisis in multilateralism various stakeholders can meet and talk and that opportunity must be taken furthermore it, it also must be clearly stated that the debate uh, before the G20 is characterized by false alternatives there is something between the global world trade order and the financial world order that we have now and a Trump style protectionism on the other hand between that you have uh, social and ecological rules for globalization allowing the opening of markets and the EU can only say then that the time has arrived not simply to go on with business as usual in the free trade agenda or bilateral treaties as designed hitherto and as we've drafted with Japan rather we need treaties that harness the opportunity of the hour to bring in social and ecological rules which can be implemented as part of the standards in which they're enshrined and it can't go on as it has done we need rather a strengthening of international cooperation but this must come in a form that strengthens social and ecological rules however what's going on in Hamburg right now in this G20 summit is sad in another way because Hamburg, Hamburg is in fact a liberal city with a liberal spirit uh, it's not just a question of welcoming heads of state but also welcoming peaceful demonstrators and it has to be an open city for them too thank you uh, Rolandis Paxis for one minute Thank you, President. Economic growth, trade, taxation, these are the most important issues addressed by summits such as the Hamburg summit. But there's something I fail to understand. Growth, growth is uh, guaranteed. Globalization is seen as something positive, and yet, at the same time, people around the world uh, are living in poverty, increasingly so. Perhaps this is due to what's happened in the banking sector or in companies, companies that uh, sign up to agreements which are simply unacceptable in some cases. Employment and unemployment are also uh, topics of paramount importance. Growth should have a positive effect for everyone. It should trickle down, the effects should trickle down to everyone. We need to have a fairer distribution of that growth and not just corporations, international corporations making the most of it. Thank you. Gerolf Anomans for one minute. President, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to use this debate on the geopolitical implications of the G20 to co make a, a call for reviews of the Geneva Convention. This was first created with noble, uh, far-reaching objectives. However, it's now been fundamentally overtaken by events. The recent mi migrant crisis, uh, what we've seen in Eastern Europe, has now led us to recognize that this is a massive invasion with enormous cultural implications and uh, the creation of mass unemployment. It's closely linked to a dirty business being conducted by NGOs, human smugglers, and all of that takes place with the benediction of the European institutions. Let's bring an end to the Geneva Convention with a genuine migrant status which will provide for refugees being uh, received in their own regions. After what we've seen in Syria, we have to provide for rapid routes back to the countries of origin. Diane Dodds, please. Thank you, Mr. President uh, and uh, Mr. Timmermans. As we approach the G20 summit, we do so with our world facing huge challenges that threaten the common values and ideals that we share. In the United Kingdom, in London, in Manchester, in cities across Europe, Brussels, Paris, Berlin, terrorist attacks have brought death and destruction the events in the Korean Peninsula are a stark and vivid reminder of darker days we thought were in the past. The migration crisis continues. In the past 10 days alone, an estimated 10,000 migrants have arrived in Italy from Libya, 
and yet we continue with the same bit part solution uh, that we have always had. On all of these issues, a coordinated approach is required right across the G20 to bring about meaningful and lasting results. Strong and united leadership based upon shared ideas of freedom, democracy and tolerance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Dodds. Now, for a minute and a half, Françoise Grosset, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much indeed, President, President of Council, Vice President of the Commission. The world is on a volcano that could erupt at any moment. We've had uh, a civil war between Shiites and Sunnis in, in the Gulf, in Yemen, in North Korea. We see the symptoms of a profoundly unstable world. It could also be an economic and social eruption if we do not take care to strengthen against uh, globalization, regulation of financial flows, uh, fighting against dumping or working for more social justice in tax. Uh, demographic and democratic challenges, uh, economic challenges, all mean it's finally time for the EU to take a fresh look at the continent of Africa and help it develop and uh, seek peace. Uh, we need to seize the leadership that America has abandoned. Uh, Trump. Uh, puts on a good show but no one is fooled. Uh, the G20 uh, is uh, a game of musical chairs where the fastest wins. It's not just uh, China and Russia who will uh, win out there. The EU has always uh, had the mission of uh, sharing and asserting its values in these d days of commemoration where today we honor the first president of the European Parliament, Simon Veil, in Paris. Let's uh, uh, demonstrate that uh, the G20 must be the forum in which the leaders of Europe demonstrate not just that they have a vision for our continent but also for the rest of the world. Thank you. The next speaker for two minutes, Belvance Berrios. Thank you, President. Vice President, Council, multilateralism is very much in the DNA of the European Union. And this debate is, of course, essential for Europe. We've got Brexit, we've got the Trump administration. They are denying the benefits of multilateralism. And therefore, I turn to you, Vice President, for the EU and for all the heads of state and government who will be taking part in this G20. It seems to me that you have two jobs to do. First of all, within the G20 itself, you need to make sure that things are in sync that the right hand does not ignore the left or vice versa. We have an exemplary role to play like we did with COP21, the Paris Agreement, but it's not good enough to do just that and then uh, disregard the financial side of things, the financing of our ecological transition. The task force has done some work on this, task force on climate related financial disclosure and that work of the task force should be supported. The Trump administration simply wants to disregard all of these conclusions and the authority of Mr. Bloomberg. So on behalf of the Commission, I think it's your job to say to the member states, this task force is one that deserves our support and should really be the roadmap for the G20 summit. And then for the EU, it seems to me that what this means is that all of these uh, institutions in the ESB, when it comes to accounting standards and so on and so forth, in all of these entities, you need to make sure that these requirements are translated into our financial markets, taking the climate into account, investment for the climate, for a transition. We need to have long-term investments for renewables rather than fossil, uh, fossil fuel economies. Because after all, there are so many criteria of excellence that the European continent can produce. We should not ignore that. And there's the whole issue of tax havens. You need to fight against tax havens. The OECD has suggested a list, which would, I think would only include a Trinity and Tobago. That surely cannot be the roadmap of the European Union. I think that you need to bring on board all of the European stakeholders at the G20, make sure that we have a strong battle against tax havens. It must be a priority. Thank you. Ben Luca for one minute. President, ladies and gentlemen, the European Union is one of the three main players in the G20. This is why the European Union has to set itself ambitious objectives 
Africa should be helped to create growth and jobs, the whole of Africa. That, we hear, will be the solution to the migration crisis. However, ladies and gentlemen, let's keep our feet on the ground. The European Union hasn't even succeeded in bringing Greece back to growth and job creation. Greece is still a more developed uh, country with an operating government than many African countries, so we weren't able to help this country create jobs and growth. This is why it's completely unrealistic for us to talk about helping bring stability and democratic governance to the whole of Africa. Let's just stick to realistic objectives. Realistic objectives on the migration uh, crisis would mean us focusing on the Mediterranean zone, North African states and the Middle East, Arab countries, those areas where growth is required. And those are the same countries where Islamic terrorism find its feeding ground. That's the area we should be focusing on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now for one minute, Janice Atkinson, please. The G20 will actually revolve around the presidents Trump and Putin, not you. These two men working together can defeat ISIS. These two men understand the threat of migration and culture, jobs and identity. And migrants, no, no, no. What don't you understand? We've got to secure our borders. Our cultures and identities are under threat and you're incapable of dealing with it. Presidents Trump and Putin actually get this. They understand the nation state and putting up walls and barriers. Um, we need to arrest and deport the migrants and tow them back to Libya. The Paris Climate Change Agreement is a bad business deal and Trump gets that because he's a businessman and he's right. And you're obsessed with the gender agenda, please. We women don't need special treatment. I'm not special needs. I take it most of you are not special needs. Stop singling us out. And get real to the threats we face. It's migrants, ISIS and security. You don't have the solutions. The nation state is the way forward, as we're showing in Brexit and the Visegrad countries. Your speeches this morning have confirmed the death knell of the EU is ringing. So get used to it and go back to your Thank nation you. states. Now for one minute, Diane James, please. Good morning, everyone in the chamber, and thank you, Mr Timmermans, for the lack of tantrums that we saw yesterday from Mr Juncker, entertaining as it was. I have two observations to make, and they are serious ones, please. Now, we've heard this morning the usual calls for open markets, improved trade agreements, and religiously enshrining and making sure delivery of consumer protectionism and such. But just remember, please, everyone attending the G20, that when we talk about the impact in terms of job losses, falling wages, and decreasing lifestyles and living standards, that's what voters measure G20 meetings by. And we need to be a little bit more flexible in terms of that approach and the timing to achieve the objectives. But the other clear message for me that I would love the G20 to address is the existing European Union monetary policy which clearly favours one major member state and penalises so many others. We have young people out there who want jobs, want, want to work, and they have to leave their countries because of the EU monetary policy. So please, can we send some very clear messages and change tact? Thank you very much. Now for a minute and a half, Pilar del Castillo Vera. Sí, eh, Thank you very much, President, Council, Commission. I think it's important to recall that the history of, in the history of humanity, there's never been a single period where we've had progress using isolation or through protectionism. We've never moved forward uh, using those tools. I think it's important to recall that. In, also, it's important to make sure that we need an to, to, to say that we need an open economy and an open society. These are the only ways of moving forward, and that is why the European Union needs to make sure that at the G20, our position is one of leadership, constant leadership, vis-à-vis uh, -vis the isolationist tendencies that have been demonstrated by some countries at the moment. That's really important. We need openness. We don't need isolationism. And it starts, of course, back home, first of all. 
And from that point of view, the digital single market needs to be a reality, a full reality. We should start with that. This is a crucial factor in terms of competitiveness on the global stage for our economies. And that's why we should welcome the fact that the Estonian presidency has really made this a priority. Digital matters have become a, a flagship issue for you. And I very much look forward to that. And I'm confident that we will be able to reach an agreement on this code the European Code on Electronic uh, Communications, and that would be our contribution to better connectivity. Our companies, our businesses, our societies need that connectivity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, one minute, Petro Silva Pereira. President, Commissioner, as the EP rapporteur on the trade agreement with Japan, I would like to emphasize the huge strategic importance of this agreement, a political agreement that the two parties will announce uh, tomorrow in a bilateral summit on the margins of the G20. This agreement between uh, the two of the major world economic powers is an excellent opportunity for the European economy and it sends a strong message against protectionism and in favour of open trade and of course also for a more regulated and just uh, world trade. Let's be clear, this is not the final conclusion of uh, some open questions. Uh, the European Parliament uh, will be careful to ensure that <coughs> There is more transparency at the end of the negotiations, starting with the dissemination of negotiating mandates and a set of rules on social, labour and environmental aspects of sustainable development. This is a broad, uh, fair agreement between you, EU and Japan. Minute and a half for Elisabetta Gardini. Uh, Vice President Tillmans, we are just in a news agency what has been happening in Austria and that Austria has announced that it will be reinstating border controls at the Brenner Plaza and that the Commission can't stop this. So in the Italian press today we have seen pictures all over the place of this and you can imagine that we are also talking about how people are reacting. Unfortunately the veil of hypocrisy has now clearly fallen. The there's an enormous difference between words and facts in so many European countries, but ultimately the countries all seem to be acting in the same way. So in Berlin there seems to be an illusion that we've got results. At the same time, what we've actually achieved is pretty meagre. This code for NGOs, whereas ports in other European countries are still closed to refugees. This is why we all seem to be investing so much hope in the G20. As we've heard, this is the most important international forum which is designed to promote cooperation. Let's hope that this forum will actually address migration in the Mediterranean. This is a phenomenon whose extent is now so great that it has to be managed by the whole international community. I would like, also like to ask you to tell President Juncker that we don't want any ridiculous solutions, please. On Saturday in this very house we commemorated the life of Helmut Kohl. He was referred to as a man of the future because he chose the right course forward and history thanked him for that. So either Europe uh, proves itself able to make such wise choices again or Europe will disappear. And if that were to happen, uh, let's not regret it. Thank you very much. Two minutes now, Caroline van Brems. Thank you, all for Thank you, President. The idea of building more connection in the world, bringing us together, might seem to be quite cynical when you see what's happening in Italy. And as you said yourself, Vice President Timmons, uh, Timmons uh, if all member states were to do what they promised to help us to tackle this crisis, we wouldn't find ourselves in such a dire situation. So it's quite scandalous that we are where we are. And clearly I'll support your efforts, but I think it's important that we know that the migration crisis is not something which we can solve through short-term measures. The only way we can tackle this crisis is by creating a more interlinked world. And one of the most important things we can do in the G20 summit is to pave the way for a united position so as to ensure that we can uh, implement the Paris Agreement on the climate. If we don't tackle the climate problem, uh, problems such as the migration crisis today will give us some taste of what we have in a far 
to a far greater extent in the future. So in the Commission's work programme, there's a great deal of stress on the need for us to set a good example. Looking round to colleagues here in this House, we're working on a whole series of files, such as the Clean Energy Package. Let's try to ensure that we adopt ambitious legislation. That's our responsibility. Secondly, the United States. As you, you all know, I'm not, I can't be positive about what President Trump's been doing and might do in the future. But let's not turn our back to the United States. Let's reach out to those states in that country who do want to continue to make progress, who aren't simply subservient to Trump. And within the G20, I think we should use bilateral contacts to do that. My third point. So we now have a trading scheme for emissions. Let's not just stop there. Let's create a connection so as to ensure that the rest of the world can also be encouraged to establish pricing mechanisms for CO2. So I wish you every success for the summit. I think more than ever, the European Union needs to make progress in all those areas. Thank you. And now, a minute and a half, Paolo Rangel. Thank you, President. Council, Vice Presidency of the Commission, I would like to make three comments on this occasion. Uh, this doesn't necessarily concern the program of the G20, but rather the international economic circumstances under which the G20 summit is taking place. My first comment. What's happening in North Korea? What's happening uh, with Qatar? Uh, the Arabian Peninsula and all of the countries in this region, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. I think what is required now is some kind of global intervention. Of course, we also need uh, policies for the long term, and the G20 should think about that, of course. But we have a crisis on our hands in Korea, in, on the Arabian Peninsula, and as long as we have that crisis, long term efforts will not. Uh, bear fruit. The United States, China, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, they need to, you know, get these things straight and we need to play our role. Now, on the program of the G20 proper, a comment on that. I would say that the European Union, and we don't really need the G20 for this, you know, the European Union can't just abandon Italy, Greece, Spain. They can't be left to handle the refugee situation on their own. We need the North, we need the East, we need the West and the South of Europe all acting together on this issue. And the second comment I wanted to make, I mean Portugal has some experience in Africa and I would say in the light of that experience that if we don't invest into Africa at the G20 summit then unfortunately this tragedy will continue and will grow and grow on the Mediterranean. Thank you, Otmar Karras for one minute. Ladies and gentlemen, President this weekend as so often the question will be how do we deal with the challenges of globalization and its uh, misfirings we're all aware that we have to shape globalization so that globalization does not shape us to that end Europe must uh, harness its uh, strength the problems within Europe are not ones that start or end at the external border of the EU. Hence, from the G20, I'm expecting a clear statement against protectionism in favour of multilateralism and fair international trade and in favour of the observance of international agreements, laws and values. Yes, we need global governance. Yes, the future of our shared world must be a shared responsibility. Refugee flows and migration flows are a global challenge. Africa is a global challenge. Let's finally fight for more fairness and justice, responsibility and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, 20 countries, 20 different political systems, uh, 20 different levels of development, uh, uh, four-fifths uh, of uh, global GDP, three-fourths of global trade, uh, two-thirds of the global population, uh, 
uh, who can be better placed uh, to solve the problems uh, we are faced with uh, than the G20? We've always uh, been dealing uh, with uh, global challenges, uh, but now we are faced uh, with the question uh, of uh, interconnection of the world, uh, of uh, harnessing uh, globalization. Uh, we need to fight uh, protectionism and the narrow-minded national policies. Uh, we need uh, to harness globalization uh, and uh, make its benefits uh, widespread. Uh, Empowering women is one of the topics uh, on the agenda of the G20, and uh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'm certain uh, that uh, they will also talk about uh, many other topical issues, such as the situation in Korea and uh, other issues, uh, and I hope uh, that uh, this will uh, bring Trump and put it closer. Thank you. Thank you. Gunnar Hockmark for one minute. Speaker, the last 20 years, globalization has defeated poverty in region after region. There is more to do, but it's a process that is thanks to the globalization, and it has created bigger markets for European companies than we have ever seen, crucial for the recovery we are just seeing in the European economy. And we need to defend the stability of this world order that has provided for this. We need to see Russia as the threat it is, with the disinformation, cyber war, and the warfare we see in, for example, in Ukraine. And we need to see that the U.S. is not the credible partner we are used to see. When the U.S. gets smaller, we need to get taller, reaching out for free trade and supporting multinational governance. That is the most important aim, that we can take leadership in this global development. Thanks. Thank you very much. And now for one minute, Christopher Fjellner. Thank you, President. There's a whole wave of protectionism around the world. Trump and Brexit may have been the most clear manifestations thereof. G20, Hamburg, this is a golden opportunity for us to tackle protectionism. We, don't, we can't afford this protectionism in our part of the world. It costs money. It also costs jobs. But what about the poorer parts of the world? There it's costing lives. Since 2008, three times more, three times more protectionist measures have been introduced in these countries, you know, more than the kind of measures that would alleviate trade three times more protectionism than open trade. Now, G20 at the time made a declaration saying we want to open up trade, but tra uh, Trump has put a stop to that. And therefore, if uh, the USA is withdrawing, Europe needs to take the lead. We're talking about jobs, we're talking about working with Japan, etc., but that's not enough. Free trade agreements are required with Mexico, with South America, with Australia, with New, New Zealand. I think it all hinges on Europe now if if America is stepping down. Vielen Dank. Um, Thank you. To the catch the eye, I have quite a few colleagues who have asked for the floor. I'll try to take as many as possible, time permitting. First speaker is Anna Gomez for one minute, please. O G20 podia fazer a diferença contra a desigualdade por justiça global nos impostos. In order to make a difference against uh, injustice and uh, differentials and tax havens, uh, I, I, I wouldn't uh, expect uh, the G20 to be able to do that, but I would expect some resolve in their action. I think we need a smart strategic vision and uh, see this as part of international law. There's a huge challenge here that we cannot avoid uh, when it comes to migration. We can't continue to see this as a threat uh, rather than an opportunity to work against the aging of the population and of course we must uh, tackle terrorism at its root causes. Uh, we need to work for refugees and uh, migrants rather than allowing the traffickers to make a living if we leave uh, as the EU, Greece and Italy alone to deal with the problem. We can't subcontract our responsibilities by paying for camps in Libya either. And then we will achieve nothing if we don't work on this. Migration will go on. Arvoisa puhemies, 
kun Yhdysvallat käpertyy entistä enemmän. Thank you, President. The United States of America are withdrawing, and we can now see that Europe could uh, take on a leadership role instead now. If the European Union is united, we're strong. A good example of that was the Paris Agreement on the climate. Without the EU, this agreement would not have been reached. We needed this energetic international cooperation to achieve that. We have a number of problems before us, uh, trade policy, for instance, and these are issues that are on the agenda for the meeting. The Commission should be playing an active role when it comes to trade policy because trade is being discussed around the world right now and we need agreements, free trade agreements with our partner countries. As far as globalization is concerned, once again we need to be active on the international stage. We need to act in the interest of our uh, trade as, as Europeans, are, uh, particularly with countries such as Japan. Redner, Notis Maria. Thank you. Notis Maria is the next speaker. Thank you, Chair. The G20 summit on the 7th and 8th of uh, July comes at a point in time when we have uh, the full liberalization of uh, trade, and that means that the European societies are suffering. We have uh, thousands upon thousands of poor and unemployed because the world trade is unfair. So, European and American multinational companies are outsourcing everything. They have moved industrial production in the countries of Asia, where we have child labor, very low wages, there is no notion of health and safety, and all of that always in the service of profit. We need to stop unfair trade practices and apply policies to protect the EU citizens that are losing their jobs. We need to stop CETA, TTIP and the other multilateral trade agreements. And that can only be done if we agree upon the principle of community preference. At the same time, we need to stem those uh, refugee flows that are hitting Greece and Italy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now for one minute, uh, Juan López Aguilar. Vice President Timmermans, the G20 is not a formal structure with any legal status within the international community. The European Union is, however, and we're attending that event, represented not just by the Commission but also as many as five member states. I think it would be good to avoid any uh, confused messages. We should come up with a clear message making it clear to the United States, for example, that we have to reiterate to the climate change summit uh, agreement. We also have to continue the fight against tax evasion uh, and the fight against inequality. Above all, however, we should call out for a strong response to the challenge of migration. And to do this, the European Union, I think, should be able to draw on the Lisbon Treaty so as to invoke solidarity between member states. We cannot afford to leave Italy alone. We can't abandon it to a face. We have to find legal routes to allow migration so that the uh, damned of the earth can find safe ways to Europe without finding themselves in the dangerous hands of the Mafia and dying in the, the attempt. Thank you. Jorgos Epivideas, one minute. Thank you, Chair. In the G20 summit, as usually, the discussion is going to be about all the serious issues that concern not only the EU, but the whole of humanity. However, the problems that stem from those serious issues, such as the economy, trade, uh, fair taxation, uh, as well as uh, stemming uh, terrorism, uh, cannot be imposed by the world governance that uh, the G20 and many among you wish. World governance means that we're not going to have any solutions. We're only going to have the opinions of the overlords of this world imposed upon us. We need to have cooperation among sovereign states and uh, states that act according to their own interests in the most realistic manner. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank, Herr Videos. Thank you. That takes us to the end of the catch the eye procedure.
And we now move to the Commission's statement. Uh, Mr Timmermans, you have the floor. Dent, um, I will try and react to some of the comments that were made and questions that were put to the Commission. First, on um, the refugee crisis and uh, our cooperation with the Italian authorities on a code of conduct. There is no one at the European Commission, no one who accuses NGOs of anything. I have stated very clearly yesterday in the press conference that the intentions of the NGOs are noble and good. What they're trying to do is save people from drowning in the Mediterranean. Nobody contests that. The only thing I've said very clearly yesterday, that a code of conduct could be helpful to avoid accidents at sea, to avoid misunderstandings, to make sure that the Libyan Coast Guard, once it is at the level uh, needed, can do its job in Libyan territorial waters. That is the intention of our cooperation with the um, Italian uh, authorities. I want to be crystal clear about that. And to the Honourable Member, Mrs. Gardini, I would, I would say this. Uh, I understand your criticism of the Commission and of what we're doing, but I think we're in this fight together. We're doing our best to um, encourage member states to do what they've promised and to join uh, with extra efforts um, to make this uh, situation in Italy more bearable on all of us. Uh, but I would also ask her and other colleagues here um, um, in, in Parliament, could they please help us in talking to the Prime Ministers who are part of your political families and tell them also they should take the responsibility. I understand uh, uh, Ms. Intfeldt said, said very clearly she criticised the Prime Minister from her political family. Great, but talk to the Prime Ministers in your political family and convince them to do what needs to be done and then we can all do the same job together. I think this is, instead of criticising each other, we're on the same on the same line, Commission and European Parliament, and let's join efforts and convince the leaders of our nations, who are all part of, of one of mainly three political families in this House, to make sure that they do their bit. I, I believe if we do that together, we will uh, get results uh, fairly uh, quickly. Now, um, just a, a, a remark about Brexit. Um, I know that Mr Finch uh, operates under the um, Farage doctrine here in the European Parliament, which is make outrageous statements and then run away uh, before anybody can, can react. Um, but still, I want to use the opportunity to react. I think we are all under a, an economic, political, and above all, moral obligation to do the least harm possible in this Brexit process. I think nobody disputes that position and attitude of the Commission, of the Member States, and I would argue also of Her Majesty's government in London. Um, but to go from there and to say um, that uh, the whole of the European Union is going to suffer terribly uh, in the G20 because of Brexit is a bit rich, uh, uh, frankly. And Mr Finch, uh, you, you know, just so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a great admirer of British culture and I, I, I love the UK deeply, whether they're in the EU or not. Uh, but Mr. Finch really reminds me of a character created by John Cleese um, uh, in uh, Monty Python's uh, The Holy Grail. It's a black knight who, after being defeated terribly and all his uh, limbs cut off, says to his opponent, let's call it a draw. Um, what, what I would like to say to Mrs. Morvai, who has developed a new uh, uh, practice of asking questions to me every time I'm here and credits to her she waits to hear the answer um, um, I, I wanted to say this um, she asked me precisely the question about refugees but let me turn this around one moment what would have happened if in 1956 the Swedish Prime Minister the Danish Prime Minister the German Chancellor the Dutch Prime Minister the Belgian Prime Minister, the Luxembourgish Prime Minister, would have said, these Hungarians, these people culturally don't belong here. These people will change our culture in a way that we cannot accept. What would have happened in 1956 if that would have been done? 
I am proud of a European legacy where we, when people are persecuted by an inhuman communist regime such as the regime at the time in Hungary find safe refuge in other European countries and the Hungarian communities across Europe have made an incredible contribution to uh, our societies and have reached the highest level of all these societies in the first, second and third generation. That would be my answer to you, Ms. Morvai. And, in, uh, and, 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 fine. and to Ms. Atkinson, I would, like, I would like to say, to Ms. Atkinson, I re really would like to say, how can you develop this profound admiration for President Putin on the basis of sovereignty and national sovereignty. Who in Europe has had more disregard of national sovereignty than President Putin who occupies part of another sovereign nation? Who has had less disregard for this? How can you admire a man and his politics based on your analysis of national sovereignty? It is completely beyond me. Um, and finally, if you will allow me, I will answer Mr. de Graaf in the same language he and I share. Um, Mr. de Graaf heeft het over... Mr. de Graaf was telling us about patriotism and the patriot country which his leader back in the Netherlands is always telling us about. Mr. de Graaf represents a political movement which is present in the country I know best and which has achieved success with part of the electorate, people who feel they've been abandoned by traditional parties, including my own party. If people support your party, that gives you enormous responsibility. You have to do your best to try to tackle the problems which people think you can solve. However, Mr. de Grasse movement simply abandons the people who support it. All it does is feed into their anger, it feeds into their rage, but they never come forward with constructive solutions. They never try to be part of the solution. They simply try to magnify the problems, to magnify them beyond recognition. So, Mr. de Graaf, what I would say to you is that I can see a model of patriotism in Europe, a patriotic country, a patriotic country which I think was ex ex extolled in Bratislava by European leaders, the kind of patriotism which want to work together to create, the type of patriotism which people want to pursue in the future. And this same model will be promoted in the G20 summit in Hamburg by European leaders. They'll be extolling the virtues of our model, describing it as a model for the rest of the world making it clear that the prosperity of Europeans can only be guaranteed on the basis of sustainability. However, Europeans have to do this together. We can't w move forward on the basis of a misguided idea of individual countries. We need to give everybody in societies the strength to work together with their compatriots to form a better and stronger world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President, and thank you also for reminding us of John Cleese and his contributions to our common European culture. Please do inform us when you charge a commissioner with a department for silly walks. Um, <laughs> so without further quack, we go to the Council's reaction now. Minister Masikas, please. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for your comments that remind us once again that these are challenging times we are facing on several fronts, especially, especially with the geopolitical and political uncertainties uh, still very high. Um, I therefore look forward to a strong message of confidence by G20 leaders. We need to preserve the spirit of cooperation in, in the G20 and, and to continue providing multilateral answers to the challenges that we are facing. This also means maintaining and building on the achievements of the past and not giving in to protectionism and isolationism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. And this concludes this item on the agenda. And we come damit zum nächsten Tagesordnungspunkt. 
we move on to the next item on our agenda. Statements by Council and Commission on the presentation of the programme of activities of the Estonian Presidency.